Amen. Well, it's good to be here. Good to see everybody once again. It's been a while, uh, but thankfully this church has been out to the home uh, numerous times, and uh, I stay in contact with the pastor every week, and I appreciate his friendship. Uh, it's uh, nice to have friends, and it's nice to have friends that will reach out to you, and you're not the only one. So I'm thankful for that, and everybody here that's done something for us. You say, I haven't done nothing for you. Well, you have just because you have. You're part of the church, amen. And so we appreciate that. And so we brought half the boys with us tonight on the trip out today. And uh, we've been doing uh, a lot of projects here. We started one uh, this week. I was telling uh, Brother Joe, I believe, about uh, uh, taking out the flooring upstairs in the living room and the dining room, uh, replacing 25 ceiling fans and adding some of those uh, fans in as well. We have a church coming uh, Monday, hopefully, Lord willing, uh, to help us with all these projects because you can only do so much by yourself. Amen. But uh, if you see our prayer letters, we've had uh, a couple of updates this year that are that have been a blessing to us. One is uh, the Millers. Uh, they moved uh, officially in June of this year, and uh, all six of them come down from Indiana, uh, where my wife's from. We've known them for uh, I've known them for about eleven years. My wife's known them for a little bit longer, uh, but they're able to to be there now. So now instead of taking all the boys on a trip everywhere I go, I can leave some, and that's a blessing. So somebody says, "How do you pick and choose?" Well, obviously I pick all the good ones. Just kidding, because <laughs> the, the ones that are causing trouble, they need to come too. So you never know who I have over here. Are these all the good boys? Are they all the bad ones? You don't know, so pray for them all. Amen. But I appreciate how God uh, has uh, allowed us to continue this uh, this work here. It's been going on for 31 years now. Miss Palmer's still alive, and she's won't actually come down to the home. I'm not sure if I share that with you. She come just a few months back, and she goes, "I want to start coming. I just want to move back here since Brother Palmer passed in December." Uh, and just come out here and work. I said, oh, Miss Palmer, this isn't the girls' home, okay? This is the boys' home. It's a little different than what it used to be because they started the girls' home there. Uh, but uh, some more updates is we have our, our son. Uh, he's three months old. Uh, he's about this big now. He's a... He's an infant, but he's a big infant, you know, and uh, he's three months old. He's a big boy like his daddy, I guess, and uh, our two girls pray for them um, as they, uh, I try to drag them around where I go sometimes, but sometimes you got to leave mom and the kids at the house. I hope you all understand. You want to see them more than you see me. I know uh, you've already told me that, but uh, uh, sometimes I will drag them. Hopefully, maybe the next time we come by, you'll get to see them, or this is just a motive, an opportunity for you all to load up again and drive to the house and see them. You know, we're all about six hours away. You know, if you speed, it'll be a little less than that. And, um, and pray for us as we uh, continue to, to take in new boys. Uh, we have we have 13. I, I sent one home a couple weeks ago. Well, he, he went home and, and uh, he graduated and all that. And, and we have a constant flow of boys wanting to come in. Uh, but when I'm traveling the road, it's hard for me to really commit to having a new boy come in if I'm not there. I hate to leave him with the Millers. Uh, they're still new. I hate to just leave him with my wife. And so pray as we um, we get done with some of our travels that I can start taking more boys in and pray. I've been, your pastor's been on me this, and I've been asking him to help me pray about this. I'm always back and forth. Do you go over 14 boys? And uh, I talked to brother uh, Caleb Hewitt has been spending some time down there at the house this past week and his father-in-law come out to pick up the trailer. And he says, well, he goes, I was in a, I was a men's home. I hopefully you don't mind me saying this, but he goes, I was in a home and he goes, it was just too many or, you know, whatever. It's something like that. And, uh, and I said, well, brother, I said, I want to do the same thing. I, I don't want to have too many. I want to have just enough to where we have this, um, uh, this home feeling. And I don't want to have it to where, uh, we lose the quality of, of seeing those young men get saved, teaching them, training them and not have be a number. You know, when I was in the home, you know, we only had eight boys at a time and that was, that was, that was a good number, but I, I'm trying to be as effective as, as possible. And uh, people say, oh, how do you know, or how do you get to number 14? That's how many seats I have on the bus. And, uh, if I was able to put a rack on top and tie some, I guess we could go up to 15 or 16, but the, I don't know if that's, that's legal or not. Uh, but, uh, so I'm staying at 14, you know, cause that's how I can fit in the bus with me. And uh, just pray that either we get a bigger bus or the Lord allows me to to get them our boys since we can't leave them behind. So y'all help me pray about that. Uh, and then they continue the projects. We're starting um, updating some things uh, in the prayer letter. We talked about the seven HVAC units that we've got to replace uh, on the property. And, and uh, I always tell people we have 18 showers, 24 toilets, and 25 sinks. And so plumbing is always an issue. So there's always something leaking. And you don't believe me, come to the house. You'll know. You know how it is, brother. And so we got a lot, a lot of that things going on, but God has been blessing. He's been giving us food left and right. Uh, Dollar General's freezer went out a while back and we got uh, two more pallets of food. And then, uh, the, the brother Brown from, um, Ranger, Georgia there, White Plains. Is it right? Yeah, brother, uh, 
this. Anyway, they brought up, they brought some food out. The Browns did. They they had three hogs, and that's about six hundred pounds of pork. So we're able to put that in our freezer. Uh, it's just like um, the church here, and uh, you know, um, bringing the cows May of 2000 or 2020 right not 2000 but may of 2020 when we ran out of food about and uh, the church was a blessing here and used members of this church to to get us that cow and then bring us another one as well and so pray for that And i've got a um god has given us the ability to uh to meet certain people and there's a generator we come across that's 150k that we need uh just like when we got the cow donated that one night guess what the power was out again because the power always goes out in Mississippi. It's the strangest thing. You, you remember you're showing up, we're eating zucchini boats out of our gas stove and waiting for the power to come back on so we can put the meat in the freezer. <laughs> and so God has blessed us with just giving us food left and right, canned food, uh, just donating the meat for us. And our food bill has tremendously dwindled, so we're able to put other funds into the home. Uh, again, we are a tuition-free home. We don't make the parents pay, but we ask, you know, of course, I don't want any parent taking advantage of what we have to offer, but sometimes it's going to happen. But I'm going to offer a ministry uh, as long as we can without having to charge anybody, uh, you know, forcefully and just say, give what you can give. You know, each month, if you can get $50, give $50, and you give 800 give 800 give 1000 give 1000 and if you win the lottery, give it to us, we won't say nothing. And so I'm going to have the young man come up and sing. Uh, and I'll, they always get nervous. I come and get them up here and break the ice, just sing. I said, don't worry, after you, I said, the, the ladies are going to sing, and they're just going to knock it out of the park, and no, everybody's going to forget you. You know, so just kidding. We're, gonna, we're just going to sing for the Lord. I, I tell them, I said, I ain't worried about our voices. I said, we're just going to sing for the Lord. Get them up here. Uh, give them the experience of standing in front of a church so that uh, when they get out of here and they go back to where they're from and they find a, hopefully a good local independent Bible, believe in church, that uh, they can get in there and not be ashamed to be able to teach a Sunday school class, lead the singing and all that. We teach that at the home. And so we teach them how to do Sunday school, lead the singing. Uh, sometimes we'll go to churches, and that matter of fact, the pastor say, you know, they'll know what we do, and they'll say, hey, one of your young men will lead the singing. I say, sure. And then somebody volunteer, and uh, we, we try to make sure that we're not just, uh, uh, you know, we're not, we don't sit around and play video games. We don't have a, a we don't have a console, hallelujah, because we got plenty of things to do around there. We got plenty of things to clean and fix. Amen. Y'all sing now. Amen. Joshua twenty four fifteen. And if it seem evil on you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord, yes, bless the Lord, well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all his benefits or the blessings that he brings. Lifting up my hands to the great I am, let me never be ashamed. With all that is within me now, oh, bless his holy name. Now Jesus is to me my everything, and I'll bless the day he came. When he gave me drink from the fountain sweet, that I'll never thirst again. Now through the Spirit of the Son, to the Father I can say, For your saving blood and for all you've done, bless your holy and sweet name. Oh, bless the Lord, yes, bless the Lord, well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all his benefits or the blessings that he brings. Lifting up my hands to the great I am, let me never be ashamed. With all that is within me now, oh, bless his holy name. Someday I'll live beyond the blue where a better home awaits. There I'll lay aside for the crown of life, all the sorrow, death, and pain. To see my loved ones and to know I will leave this world behind. I will lift my hands and I'll bless his name while shouting through the sky. Oh, bless the Lord, yes, bless the Lord, well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all his benefits or the blessings that he brings. Lifting up my hands to the great I am, let me never be ashamed. With all that is within me now, oh, bless his holy name. With all that is within me now, oh, bless his holy name.
Man of sorrow, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Spotless Lamb of God was yeah. He.
is he really that wonderful? Let me ask that again. Is he really that wonderful? Then should not the heathen know how wonderful he is? Should not the darkest corner of the continents be filled with the light of his glory so that somebody could know what we already know? (laughs) Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Well, you don't have to look too far. Just look in the mirror. You'll see what a Savior He is if you just take a minute and look in the mirror. Look where He brought you from. Look what He done for you. Amen. Look the change that He's made in you. Look at what He's prepared for you. (laughs) Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. A faithful Savior. The Bible said even if we don't believe, He abideth faithful for He cannot Deny himself, amen. Nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord stand sure having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. What a Savior. Yes. Amen. amen. What a Savior. Hallelujah. The beauty of the Bible is that it all rests on the shoulders of Christ. When you look at that Old Testament, there's, there's, there's one principal pattern of a covenant relationship. And that principal pattern of covenant came in the ministry that God had with Abraham. When God made a covenant with Abraham, he called him to the covenant grounds, and he caused a deep sleep to fall on him. Uh And when Abraham woke up, the Bible talks about a horror of darkness. But in the darkness, when his eyes adjusted, he saw a light passing amongst the pieces of the sacrifice. That wasn't a sacrifice Abraham brought. That was a sacrifice God brought. That wasn't a work that Abraham wrought. That was a work God wrought. Amen. Abraham got to enter into it. And Abraham benefited from it. But Abraham didn't do anything in it. That's how our salvation is. Amen. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. You see, he done it all. You and I hadn't done anything. Don't get it in your idea that just because we get to go tell somebody how glorious he is that we're doing anything either. Amen. We just get to be a voice crying in the wilderness telling others, look and live, look and live, just look and live because, oh, what a Savior is mine. It's not about the missionary. It's about the master. Amen. I'm sure glad there's never been a sinner that he could not save. There's never been a saint that he could not help. Amen. And that's the God that we serve. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Well, I could leave said it's been good to be in God's house. That stirred my heart tonight. And I appreciate it. Enjoyed the presentation from Mississippi. Amen. And if you have to watch them, though, they'll bring mosquitoes with them. You all need them down here, I'm sure. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. It's been a good week so far, hasn't it? Amen. Thank God. So, uh. I told you last night, and I think we're going to go ahead and do it just for a couple of minutes, but I told you last night and, and on Wednesday night, we started off by saying we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate the work that God is doing through. And Dr. Blue always said God will often give through you what he will not give to you. Amen. And what God's looking for is channels, conduits. Amen. Don't worry, he pays real good, he pays real good handling fees. Amen. He'll take care of you, but he wants to do something through you. He wants to do something here at Lighthouse Baptist Church that's bigger than Lighthouse Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and, and, and he's doing that. He's doing a work now through those 10 missionary families that the church has partnered with and committed to partner with, reaching around the world with the gospel, but the days that we are these days, we're looking for God to do even greater things in the future, going forward. Amen? And so we talked about how we want to celebrate. We talked about how we're going to confer with these families to see what we can do to reach the world with the gospel. And then we talked about how we need to make a commitment in our hearts. We need to look to God and make a commitment going forward about our own personal giving, about our own personal going, about our own personal serving, 
about our own personal witness. There's so many areas of missions, amen. So many areas of missions. And uh, and we need to make that commitment to the Lord. We're not making it to the church. We're not making it to the pastor. Don't get too nervous, but you're not even making it to the missionaries. You're making it to the Lord, amen. And that's important. So I said last night, take a minute when we went back to fellowship, and find some positive things in the lives of those 10 missionary families on the mission board in the back. Find some things in their lives, in those prayer letters. And if you didn't find one this month, you're going to have to go back and dig up something a little deeper. Amen. But go find something that we can celebrate that's taking place in the life of one of those missionary families. And I told you, probably should have divided it up, but I didn't. So let's just do it by volunteer. And uh, I brought my little notes and went back there and looked. And I brought my little notes so I could just check one off. Let's see if we can cover these missionaries. Who wants to go first? Just stand up real quickly. Tell us the missionary family and tell us something positive from their life. Who's going to go first? All right, Rachel, I figured you would. Amen. How about that? And they're still in Spain, right? Amen. And so that's a blessing. Dawn and Patsy Drake, I think we've met them on several occasions. All right, so that's the Drake family. We're celebrating, and uh, sometimes even in a military town, it's very difficult to get people to to commit to come and even have a meal with you. So they got somebody to hear the gospel. How about that? Amen. All right, who else? Somebody real quickly. I'm going to have to carry this over till Sunday morning. Okay, we'll take that anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's for the Caleb Taft. And uh, they got a, a shipping container full of Bibles and materials and literature. And uh, that's a challenge. Uganda is a landlocked country. And so for that container to get to them, it had to go around the Horn of Africa or through the Suez Canal. And then it has to come in on the Mombasa, Kenya side. And they offload it on the trucks, got to clear all the customs and, and, and regulations in Kenya. And then they cut across the country and they come into Uganda. And then, uh, from where he's at from the Kenyan border, still probably a couple of hours that they have to truck that container to get it through those countries in the middle of a COVID pandemic. What a blessing. Amen. That's exciting. We appreciate that uh, those Bibles have arrived safely in the country of Uganda. Somebody else, quickly. I'm looking for Brother Caleb. I actually spoke with Brother Jonathan Williams a couple, three weeks ago. Amen. And uh, he told me that through this COVID pandemic, they've actually, it's not been legal for them to meet. Right. How about that? How about that? Amen. In a cane field. Glory to God. Right in Panama. That's a blessing. Thank you, Brother David. Who else? All right. Amen. So wait a minute now. We've 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 celebrated. Wait, let me see if I can get all this right. So we're celebrating that the Lord helped a container arrive safely, and we're celebrating that the Lord um, gave churches that were otherwise banned from meeting a place they could meet safely, and we're praising the Lord that even though there was a conflict to schedule, um, they had people come and 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 fellowship with them so they could present the gospel, and we're praising the Lord that in that provisions have been sent. Y'all got, y'all got that common denominator, didn't you? Amen. When you celebrate the work that your missionaries are doing, you're celebrating the Lord that's doing the work through the missionary. Amen. And I say praise the Lord. All right, one more. 
Any more, real quickly. So you got six more. If my calculation is right, that's four. So you got six more. So take some time tonight, early Sunday morning. We'll try to catch one or two more of them on Sunday. What are you celebrating? You're celebrating what God is doing through the life of your missionaries. Now, I have a greater purpose. I have a greater purpose in doing that. And that greater purpose is twofold. Number one, um, as much as possible, I would encourage you as individuals at the church, I would encourage you to be, be, be diligent about learning the identity of your missionaries. And, uh, and, and I went back there and just snapped a picture and then I wrote down the list of the missionaries and so I didn't have the fronts and the backs of the cards so I didn't take the next step that I would have liked to have taken and that would have been to have asked you what's the missionary's wife's name? Amen? Oh yeah, that's important. She matters. Amen? She matters. And then, then I might would have asked you a little further, anybody able to name the children of your missionaries? Hmm? Can you name, uh, our sister, you did brother Caleb, he makes it difficult. <laughs> He's about as tough as doing the boarding home over here, amen? But, but, <laughs> y'all can laugh about that, it's alright, they're like, did he say that? I'm not sure we're supposed to laugh, it's okay, it's okay. When the fourth child comes, we always ask them, are you ready to go to the mission field? Because that's where they're headed. Amen. <laughs> but do you know the names of your chi- of the children of your missionaries? Because I remember I talked about the, I talked about those steadfast servants that leave some things and they're not the only ones that leave some things. Amen. Those children leave some things. Those young people leave some things. And there's four or five missionary kids sitting right back there. And I don't want to say too much, but. But I, I'm just saying they have to leave some things, and that, they already know that, and that's not always easy, and they're already dealing with that, even if they're just on deputation. All right, they're already dealing with that, and you and I, as supporting churches, need to be mindful of that because there's some things we can do to be an encouragement in the midst of that. You see, I started a camp ministry in. Uh, in 2002, that was the first year that we held a youth camp. It had been something on my heart for a number of years. We used Camp Canaan for three years until we just were a little big for those facilities and we moved it. We continued to operate seven years as basic training youth camps. And then in 2009, we ended up, uh, um, or 2010 rather, we merged with Northeast Georgia Youth Camp and we became the power of two youth camp. And, and y'all know that because you've been participants in that camp. And we've, we've done that together with Brother Stroud since 2010. Um, and, and, and until the last two years, we just celebrated our 10th year as the power of two. And I said that to say, the Lord put it on my heart because Papa wouldn't allow me to, to pay him on a head basis. I said, what do I need to pay? How much do I pay to use the camp facilities? And he said, ah, oh, cover the electricity. And, uh, of course, we were able to do a little bit more than that. But I just had a, a set amount that we gave to use the facility for those first three years. And then when we moved to Sand Mountain three years in, um, they had a different pricing structure. And that structure was based on the head count. Well, when we started at Camp Canaan, I made a decision that the children of any active missionary family would be allowed to come to our camp free of charge. We'd never charge them. And then when we got ready to move up to Trenton, I was concerned about that because we always run a shoestring budget. I mean, if it wasn't for a love offering or two that comes in at the last minute, we generally would have been in the, in the block. We would have been upside down uh, underwater. And of course, God always took care of that. But I asked the Lord and the Lord just nudged me. He said, I'll take care of that, just let folks know. And I wrote a letter, and several churches sent funds in. We started an MK fund, and that fund still exists today between myself and Brother Gary Crisp. And uh, we've probably, in the last, oh, I don't know, 17 or 18 years, we've probably been able to help. I would venture to say we're pushing close to 100 children of missionary families 
Um, at, I know one year we bought nine airline tickets. It just depends on what funds were available. We flew kids in. We've run shuttles to the airports. And then in the last several years, we've actually been able to give the kids of missionary families an opportunity to go to another mission field. That's kind of a neat thing. They sometimes get kind of submersed in their field, but they don't know there's another field somewhere. And, and so we've been able to help a little bit with that. And I said that to say, so I know a little something about missionary kids. I know a little something about those families. And uh, it does good when that missionary family walks in your church and they're on furlough and you can say, man, you've grown up, but I believe you are, and then give those kids names and and acknowledge them and know them. Amen. Boy, that makes a huge yeah. difference in the life of those missionary families, especially those kids. They appreciate it. And then i got to give you my other little two cents worth of counsel. They're kids. They're not in a glass box. You know, you go in somebody's house and if they have a curio cabinet, your kids don't get the things out of the curio cabinet and play with them. They may be toys, <laughs> but we don't play with them. We don't touch them. If you're my boys, I don't even let them get close to the glass of the case because that in and of itself it can be dangerous and detrimental to the health of the item in the case. <laughs> Amen. You've heard of bulls in china shops. <laughs> we are the ones they use in the dictionary beside that picture. <laughs> but your missionary kids, sometimes when they come to visit, they're like, they're like little toys that got put on the shelf in a curio cabinet. And everybody looks at them and says, Wow, look at them. They look almost normal. <laughs> I'm not real sure, but they're close. Alverson girls excluded, amen. <laughs> but 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 no, open the door and take them out. All right? And just play with them. Just just make them normal, everyday, average Joe, run of the mill kids. Right? That makes a difference. Amen. Amen. Well, what we're going to do? I want to. I want to do something tonight because the Lord really put it on my heart, and I'm trying to watch the clock. But it is Friday night, so it's not. It's not a work night. But would you? Would you give me maybe ten minutes? I think I can do this in ten minutes. I want to walk you through. I want to walk you through five places. In the New Testament, five passages of Scripture. Real quickly, I want to walk you through those five passages of Scripture. And I want to show you how God laid out a pattern for New Testament missions. And I think in doing that, you see, you hear your missionaries come and say things like, I'm going to Forfar and we're going to start a church. God gave us a building, but we're going to start a church. Or you hear a man say, I'm going to Japan and we're going to start a church. Well, what does that mean? Because the reality is, if I were to ask for a show of hands, it's unlikely that very many of us have ever been involved in base level church planning. Is that right? <laughs> Don't let this throw you too hard, but most of your missionaries have never been in base level church planning, right? And God called them and they've got a burden and they've studied and they've sought counsel and they, they, they've done things, they've said under other men, but ultimately they've not even done it themselves. But we've got a pattern. God the Holy Ghost lays out a pattern in the Scripture. Now, you and I both understand that the Scriptures, as we know it, are inspired of God. But the references were added for our convenience. Now, don't let that throw you, man. But but when we got a Bible, when when Paul wrote a letter, it didn't come with chapters and verses. Okay? And even the chronological order of the scriptures, God has kept the canon of scripture, but it's not, it's not given to us. The scriptures are not laid out in your Bible in a chronological order either. They overlap each other. They, 
They overrun each other at times and that God has a purpose in all of that and He's had His hand in all of that. But when you come to the New Testament and you walk through the New Testament, God has laid out the typical, and there's a key word, typical, because sometimes certain fields demand something that's atypical. I imagine Brother John didn't really think that his ministry would be hiding in a cane field preaching on Sunday, but that was the circumstances that he found himself in. And uh, so sometimes fields are a bit atypical, and sometimes the approach has to be a little different, especially if a country's closed and the church is underground, right? But the classic, typical, biblical pattern that God laid out for you and I in relationship to preaching the gospel and establishing New Testament churches follows the order of the canon of Scripture in the New Testament. And if you look at the Gospels in the last chapter or almost the last chapter, the closing comments, if you will, of the four Gospels, all four of them, in those closing comments, compels us to missions. One man said, whatever the, the, whatever the last words of man are, are the words he definitely wants you to hold on to. And if that's the case, then, then we find that the last words of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, all of those have something to do with New Testament missions. Amen. And so I want to look at those with you. And we, we find that if we start with the first one, we would go to the Gospel of Matthew. And I want you to turn there, Matthew chapter number 28, Matthew chapter number 28. And I'm going to do my best to try to walk through this in a, in an expedial, a, 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 an expeditious kind of fashion so that we don't get too bogged down. But in Matthew chapter 28, now all of these references in the Gospels where Christ is compelling us to missions is post-resurrection. It's after he has risen from the grave. Now what do we find? Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. The Bible said this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying... Now this is what he says to them in his resurrected form. He's saying, All power is given unto me in heaven... And in earth. Now this is a camp meeting shouting point. Am I right? I mean anybody, anybody worth half the salt in their bread can get up and say all power. Jesus has all power. And if we got any shout in us at all, it'll stir something up in us. Amen? Am I right? Yeah. It's not a baited question. It's a good thing that he possesses all power. Amen? But wait a minute. Why did he tell us that? Did he tell us that so that we could brag about how powerful he is? No, no, no. But in verse number 19, you'll notice the first three words, Go ye therefore. You know what that therefore does. You have to draw an air back and find out what was before. And he said, Because I have all power, I am telling you to go Ye therefore, by the way, power in your Bible usually carries with it two ideas. One is ability and the other is authority. God said, I have the authority and he said, I have the ability. Amen. And so he said, go ye therefore. Now, this is where it gets interesting because the first step, and that's what I'm talking about, to establish in a New Testament church in a new place In verse number 19, the first step is this. He said, go ye therefore, and this is where us independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist preachers kind of drop our chins a little bit. He said, and teach all nations. What? No, I thought I got the thunder from the pulpit. I get to preach. Well, you do. But he said the first step to build in an, a church is not the preaching, but the teaching. 
That goes against the grain. But it don't matter if it goes against the grain. It don't go against the book. I had a fellow tell me, he said, God just called me to preach. He didn't call me to do any of that teaching. He didn't call me to go in that instructing. Well, I said, you're going to have a pretty shallow church. By the way, I, I, I would argue with him because I believe Paul said that he was called only not just to preach, but to do some teaching too. Amen. Now, wait a minute. Let's, let's just figure out what he said here in verse number 19. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Interesting. Now, how do you join Lighthouse Baptist Church? And that's a terminology. I know that the word join is not in your King James Bible. I get that. Well, it may, the word join is, but not in the, not in the sense of joining in membership. But there is a principle in our Bibles that we are committed and identified with a local assembly. Can I have an amen right there? So if I were to say, if I were to say, Pastor Jamie, tell us how you can join and be a member of Lighthouse Baptist Church. In the classic traditional fashion, we would say there's three ways that you can be a member of a Baptist church. Number one, you can join with a letter from another church of like faith and order. Number two, if that church no longer exists or perhaps has gone doctrinally errant, then you can join by statement. Or number three, if you've never been baptized... What we need to do is you need to come as a candidate for baptism and we will welcome you into our fellowship through baptism. Is that right? Uh, that, that's Bible right there. See, so what did God or what did Jesus tell the first missionaries to do? He said that you're going to have to go find some believers and then they're going to have to be baptized, not for their salvation, they're already saved, but they're going to have to be baptized to unite them into a local assembly. Amen? Now, can I say something to you? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to bog down. And I'm definitely going to miss my 10-minute mark, but I, I'll, I'll try not to bog down too badly. But can I say something to you about this? It's important to understand that the first people that ever got saved didn't get saved on the day of Pentecost. But the Gospels are full of people that Jesus saved while he was on earth. Amen? I don't have no problem believing that, and I don't think you have any problem believing that. And he saved them. They're as saved as you and I were. They're as saved as Old Testament patriarchs were. They just got saved on the back side of Calvary. We're on the front side of Calvary. So what this text tells us that Jesus instructed those disciples to do, he said, go find those that got saved. Amen. Go find those that I have saved. And when you find them, get them together. They don't even know what happened in their lives. They've not been indoctrinated concerning their salvation. You had to get them to a place where they knew they were lost and they knew what Jesus had done to the degree that he had died as their substitute and possessed the power through his resurrection to save them. But there's a whole lot more in that book about what he'd done when he saved them that they don't know yet. Amen. Amen. You didn't either. Amen. And so the missionary goes out and he finds people that have been saved by in a previous manner, not, not different manner, before he got there. And it's interesting. It's always interesting to me when you start talking to missionaries that go out and plant churches. They'll say, they'll say, I found a family that was praying for a preacher. They got saved. They got saved in another city, but they moved here. Or there was a crusade or campaign that came through, or they read a gospel track, or they picked up a shortwave radio station. If we don't believe those things work, let's don't invest in them. Amen? 
But somehow, somewhere they got saved. They didn't go to church. They're not discipled. They're not even indoctrinated. And there is a difference in indoctrination and discipleship, by the way. But he said, they don't know any of that stuff. They just know I once was lost. But now I'm found. Remember an old blind boy? They said, don't you know he's a sinner? And he said, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. I don't have no idea if he's a sinner or not. But he said, one thing I do know, I once was blind, but now I see. Amen. And, you, and, and your missionary, he goes down to the hardware store. And and, uh, and, and, and this would be more evident if I wasn't preaching. Them, and our missionaries were Japan and Scotland, which is... Not exactly third world culture, but, but if I was talking about a man in Panama or a man in Mexico or a man in Honduras or, or, or Costa Rica, he'd go down to the hardware store because he's got to do something to that house that he's just bought. And while he's down there at the hardware store, it'll, it'll automatically bring up a conversation. And the conversation will go something like this. What are you here for? Now, they don't want to know what you came to buy. They want to know, what are you here for? Like, why are you in our town? Why are you in our country? You don't speak our language. You don't eat our food. You, you, you're you not one of our, in our nationality. You may not even be our color. What are you here for? Well, there's the door. Get the gospel. Get to hell. Well, I came to tell people about Jesus and start a Baptist church over on such and such a street. A Baptist church, a Christian church. Yeah, that's right. You need to meet Joe. Joe comes in here all the time and he's a nut. But Joe's a believer. That's what he tells us he is. He don't, he, he's different than everybody else, but he says he believes in this Jesus. And he said, yeah, I need to meet Joe. We'll come find out Joe's a Christian. He's been born again. And then there's Sally and there's Sam and there's Paul and Peter and you know, and it's not long until he's got a little nucleus of people. And he starts teaching them. That's the word the Bible used. So my E word is the first step in establishing New Testament church is education. Amen. Education. He starts teaching them. By the way, the word teach appears in that text twice, Brother Samuel. Not once, but twice. The first teaching comes before baptism. The second teaching comes after baptism. The first teaching is the indoctrination of salvation. What happened when you got saved? I know you repented. The Lord saved you. But let's go a little deeper. Let's understand the doctrine of salvation. All right? And then he said they're baptized. So they commit to the membership of that local church. Amen? There ain't a brighter string in me. So don't go there. Amen? I'm, just listen to me. I said it and I didn't apologize and you can record it and put it out anywhere you want to. Amen. Amen. I didn't say they had to be baptized by somebody that had been baptized by somebody who had been baptized by John the Baptist. That crowd claims that hadn't either. Amen. They hadn't either. But I tell you what, they have been. They can be scripturally baptized by minister of the gospel. Amen. And, and we as a function of administration declare that ought to be an ordained minister of the gospel. And we baptize them. And how do you baptize them? Is it a Jesus only baptism? No. You say, well, that sounds good to me. It's just our salvation's in Christ alone. I understand that. But you miss the context of the scripture. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost, an acknowledgement of the Trinity. So i got to move on. I can't lodge there. But he said there's a teaching session about the indoctrination or the doctrines of salvation. And then if they are in agreement with that, they become part of that local assembly. Now, I didn't ask Brother Jamie, but I would be surprised to learn because I don't know that I know of a church in Georgia Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, or Tennessee, for that matter, that does this. If, if, if somebody comes and gets saved in our churches in the South, the norm is that we allow them to immediately become a member of our fellowship. A lot of times it takes place in the service they got saved if they have connection to that local church. That doesn't happen genuine, gen, um, generally on the mission field. Your missionary 
very often, and I'm not speaking for these two men that are three men, but, but the two church planners that are representing that, I'm not speaking for them tonight. But generally speaking, they don't immediately bring them into church membership. They generally have a discipleship plan. And that might be a three-week course or a six-week course where they have to meet once a week because I'm just going to be honest about it. Some people have got some really weird ideas that have been indoctrinated into their head by really strange things in the cultures, climates, and geographies that they find themselves in. Amen? Amen? And by doing that, you are establishing the assurance of their salvation by walking through the Bible. Now, look, I believe you can take the Bible and show somebody how to get saved. Amen right there. But you're not going to indoctrinate them in salvation in a 10-minute soul winning session at the altar while they get born again. And so they don't even accept them for church membership until they've had a period of time so that they can say, this is what the Bible teaches about being saved, about being part of a church, about being part of this body of believers. And at the end of that, Brother David, they say, I agree with that. I'm in on that. That's what I want. He said, fine. Now you can join the church. Right? Now you can become a part of this assembly. How do you do that? We're going to baptize you as a testimony that you've passed from death unto life. I'm not going into the baptism part tonight. All right? So now they're a baptized church member. But just because they know a little bit more about how it, what it means to get saved doesn't mean they know anything about how to live. But look, we got it. It's right here in the book. So now we see verse number 20 comes into play. So in verse number 18, there's power and authority. Verse number 19, because of that ability and authority, go find, the sa- go find those I saved, teach them, Once they are in agreement with that doctrine, baptize them, thus thus forming a nucleus of a church. Now we got a little body of believers. We got to do something else. Verse number 20. Teaching them. Now wait a minute. To observe. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Verse number 19, the word teach has to do with the doctrine of salvation. What has happened when you got saved? All right. Now, verse number 20 has to do with the discipleship and service. They need to know. Now, hang on now. Somebody bring me a legalist right here. But they need to know that God expects some things out of their life since they've been saved. It's not just do's and don'ts, by the way. But there's some places you can't go. There's some things you can't do. You can't go drink anymore. You're probably going to have to stop your cussing. Huh? Not going to hang out at the bar no more. Are you listening? We know that. But they don't. And so there's a teaching that takes place. This education is both doctrine and discipleship. And in the middle is what I call church membership identified by that act of baptism. So now where do we go? Where do we go now? Well, let's go to the Gospel of Mark. And we've already been there, so we'll just, we'll just jump in real quickly. So in Matthew's Gospel, we find the first step to establishing your missionary to establish a New Testament church. Go find those believers in that community. Go find them and give them the doctrines of salvation so that they are clear about what took place in their heart and life when they got saved. Form them into a formal assembly via baptism. And then you begin the process of discipling them, teaching them how they are to live as a believer. Now, they're doing pretty good with that. They're not perfect, but they're doing pretty good with that. Where are we going to go now? Well, we go to Mark... The second step to growing and establishing a New Testament church is not education, but it's evangelization. Amen? Now, we went and found a few folks that were saved, maybe one, maybe three, maybe two families. But now we got to go out, and now we've got some help. we got to take those that are believers that are now part of the church, and we've got to teach them how to evangelize we got to go out and tell lost people about Jesus. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that your missionary is going to sit around and do nothing until he gets this little body of believers. Y'all know better than that. He's out evangelizing, but he'll never reach that community. I mean, I, I kind of took a liking to Brother White. I enjoyed fellowshipping with him a couple nights and meeting his family. But he can't win 128 million Japanese. I like the Alverson crowd back there pretty well. And I love Scotland. And I'm dying to get my chance to go back. I've had to postpone three trips personally because of this COVID stuff. And I love him real good. And he's a go-getter, but he can't win 500,000 people. Okay? So now he's going to have these little body of believers. That's going to broaden his footprint. What are they going to do? They're going to start evangelizing. How do you evangelize? To get people into the New Testament church that you're trying to start. Well, evangelization in the Gospels takes place first in the Gospel of Mark. And then we find it in the Gospel of Luke. In Mark's Gospel, he said in verse number 15. Now, you already know where I'm going. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm just going to quote it because we ain't got time to turn. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Jesus, or Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So the gospel contains two facts. One, you're a sinner. You say, how'd you get that out of 1 Corinthians 15? Christ died for our sins. And if he died, you had some sins. Amen? All right? And then number two, he's the Savior. (laughs) He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen? Now, I'm not picking on Brother Allison, but I know a little bit more about Scotland than I do about Japan. Brother Allison is not going to go over there and condemn the socialized medicine of the Scottish people. He's not going to condemn a spot of tea at the appropriate hour in the afternoon. He's going to actually participate in that. Amen? He's not going to, he's not going to preach on tilts. He's shaking his head. He agrees. Amen? You say, preacher, what are you trying to say? And to be honest, he's probably not going to find a street corner somewhere and preach on the, the pub across the street. You say, preacher, on what grounds, Jesus? I didn't come to condemn the world. Because the world was condemned already. They already know they're lousy. The guy that staggered, staggered out of that place and couldn't hardly make his way home and throwed up all over himself and woke up in a pitiful place the next day where he couldn't remember what took place the night before and he's got a hangover and a headache and he goes back and does it again. He knows he's miserable. I don't have to tell him that. But he needs an answer. And the answer is the gospel. You see, the evangelization efforts of the New Testament church plan is Christ. Why, Brother David? Because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And so by preaching the light of the gospel, you will expose the darkness of their sin. That's natural. But it does not condemn them. They're already condemned. But it glorifies Christ. Now, I, I just, just jump with me to Luke. All the way to the end of the book of Luke. And I know I'm asking you to turn, but we're running through these. We're running. We're running, all right? Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. We find ourselves in verse number 46. And again, we're still on this topic of evangelization. The first part of evangelizing is to present Christ. Just preach Jesus. Amen? Let me say that again. Just preach Jesus. Show him glorious and high and exalted and lifted up and remind us that he's the Savior because he died and was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. So jump in with me at verse 46. Jump in. And say it unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer 
and to rise from the dead the third day. Does that not sound like the gospel? So y'all, y'all believe that Jesus put the gospel first. All right? Second illustration of that. But he put the gospel first. Now look at verse 47. Okay, so we have a sinner now presented with the Savior, but he does not know what to do with him. It's wonderful. I'm glad Christ died, but how do I apply that to me? Right? Well, here's the answer. Jesus said, not only do you declare the gospel, but you tell men how to deal with or what to do with the gospel. What do you do with the gospel? Verse 47. What did Jesus say? Preach. Now we're preaching, by the way. I, I, I failed to remind you. We went from teaching to preaching. Y'all got, we got there, all right? Verse 47. And that repentance, well, that, that doesn't seem very popular, but he didn't call your missionary to go preach something popular. Amen. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. That word preach means declared, not debated. In his name among all nations. So we got all nations. We got the world. And now we're back to all nations. And he said beginning at Jerusalem. What did he say? He said tell them about the gospel but then tell them what to do with it. Yeah. And he said, what you do with it is you come to him repenting. And you say, I'm sorry for my sins and I believe you died for me. And guess what happens? You get remission of sin. Hallelujah. He saves sinners. That's the way you evangelize to start a church plan. So we educate those believers that were already saved. We get them a part of a nucleus. Then we begin to evangelize. And the process starts all over again. Amen. Most missionaries, if they're having some success in winning souls, and some cultures are hard, and others will be more fruitful, but especially places like um, uh, some places that we would we would minister in, in, in Africa or where we might minister in in uh, Central or South America, and sometimes even in Mexico, where you have more professions on a routine basis, the missionaries usually have a pretty steady cycle of their whatever their own pattern of discipleship classes are. I mean, they they run six weeks and they start over, uh-huh. or it's four weeks and they start over, and they do that over and over and over and over again because there's a flow of new individuals that need to be indoctrinated. Why? Because we're evangelizing. But it's not just the missionary doing it, it's the nationals doing it. It's the locals doing it. And so they begin to go out and they begin to evangelize and they present the gospel and then they respond to that gospel by repenting and they're given remission of sin. And he said it happens in the name of Jesus. Amen? It doesn't happen in the name of the church. It doesn't happen in the name of religion. It happens in the name of Jesus. No wonder the songwriter said, Take the name of Jesus with you wherever you may go. All right. So we've we've got we've got Matthew saying, educate. We've got Mark and Luke that taught us how to evangelize. Then we go to John chapter 20. We gotta go to John chapter number 20. Man, I've gone way over my time. But but just just give me a couple more minutes, all right? John chapter number 20. This is the only one of these where we didn't go into the 21st chapter. We're back in chapter 20 as Jesus appears after his resurrection. Um, Verse number 19. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Let me pause as I'm preaching to Lighthouse Baptist Church and those that are visiting and let me step over on this side because this side, with the exception of, of the front row, is pretty much missionaries. And let me, let me, let me give you a little hope, a little word of encouragement out of that text. <laughs> Closed doors doesn't bother Jesus. Amen. 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 You're going to run into some. <laughs> the government will close them. The, the community will close them. Society will close them. Lack of resources will close them. 
Jesus said, I'm not the least bit worried about closed doors. When the disciples were gathered and the doors were closed, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. He's still able to pass through closed doors and to make things happen when nobody else can. He's still able. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Well, so, so, so he said he came and he stood in the midst and he said to them, peace be still. Now look at verse number 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his feet. Then they were, then the disciples were glad. The, the, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I'm interested in verse 21. Then they said, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. So we talked about education. We talked about evangelization. When that church grows to a certain point, it starts looking at expansion. That's missions. And I believe you introduce missions in the beginning. But the manifestation of that in that local assembly usually takes time. Expansion. That means getting somebody out of this one and putting them over yonder to start another one. <laughs> Amen. That's what expansion is. And so your missionary, all, I'm, I'm talking about, listen to me. And if I, if I were to ask brother, if I were to brus, ask brother Alverson or brother White to stand up tonight and I were to, and I were to say, just acknowledge if I'm on track or not, from the day they start holding services, from the day they start holding services, they've got their eyes on somewhere else. And I don't mean like I'm going to neglect this and I'm going to leave this. That's not the message. But they've, all okay, right, the Lord has started us off here. We got the ball rolling here. But man, on the other side of that mountain, there's another town and another village. And Jesus said, we got to go tell them too. They got another community picked out. Amen. And they may not be able to go themselves, but their prayer is, Lord, maybe you'll reach in and call me a preacher boy. <laughs> Amen. Or a preacher man. <laughs> and, and, and we'll get them educated and trained and, 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 and full of the Holy Ghost because that makes all the difference in the world. And then we're going to have a part in sending them to the next town. Amen. They're going to start their own church and it's going to be another independent, indigenous, Bible preaching, Baptist church. Why? Because that's God's plan. His, His plan is to expand. Amen. And he said we do that because he sends them forth. It's a mission call. Now we got this problem. Everything I just mentioned is too big for any of us. You got to go find some believers. How'd you like to be Noah? Noah, we're going to build an ark because I'm going to destroy all that lives. And you're going to save them in an ark that you're going to build. And he said, you're going to take them two by two. I wonder if old Noah said, how in heaven's name am I going to be able to round them up and bring them in? Well, read your Bible. He didn't have to. God brought him in. Now that's not a sit down, do nothing indoctrination there. All right, no, no. And if you if you need me to help you with that, I can. Because while God was bringing in the animals, Noah had to gather the food. Go read it. Noah had to gather the food. God brought the animals. Amen. Well, it kind of works that way with salvation. I'm talking about in those that need the. You know, when you're winning people to God, you, you go gather the food. He'll bring them in. <laughs> Amen. Well, how'd you like to be Noah? You gotta do all that. You don't know how to build a boat and ain't never seen one probably. But he had a, he had a help and that help was the Holy Ghost. Hey. And your missionaries are called on to edge. They, they gotta go find sinners that have already been saved in a culture that doesn't know anything about Christ, but they're there. Yeah. They gotta get this little nucleus of believers and sometimes, by the way, we have, we, hey, by the way, sometimes we have, we have lay people that go to the field with the missionary uh, yeah. so they can help him jump start the ministry. Uh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> As with a fellow in Idaho. And he said, I heard you preach that. 
And I watched half the pastors in the room there, several of them there that night, look at you with that disdain look like you want to do what with our sons and daughters? And I said, they ought to consider going to Utah or Idaho or New Mexico and, and, and just, just drop an anchor, getting them a job, buying them a house and working like everybody else and getting involved in the church. Now, I know it's a little different in Scotland and Japan, but it still works. Even if it's a short term deal, it still works. Amen. You say, why would you say the fellow trying to start a church like your brother Jordan in the western United States somewhere? Because he'll follow the same pattern I just mentioned. Why would you say he needs some lay people to help him? Well, number one, you're a tither. Number two, you're a witness. You'll get out and knock on some doors with him. Number three, you're fellowship. Amen. Amen. I need to stop right here because this could get real deep real quick. Amen. But I'm just telling you. You can be such a, somebody could be such an assistance, an aid to the missionary trying to establish that church. But over time, he's going to expand. So we got to educate, we got to evangelize, we got to expand, we got to indoctrinate, we got to disciple, we got to teach, we got to guide, we got to lead, we got to do by example, and then we got to ordain and we got to send forth and we say, man, that's too much. I can't handle all of that. Welcome to the club. (laughs) Amen. Well, where's the answer? Just turn a page or two in your Bible to Acts 1. And I'll give you this and we're going to close. And I didn't get Luke 8. I don't know. I don't know. We'll just see what the Holy Ghost said. Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power. Wait, wait, wait. I started this conversation tonight, Matthew 28, 19. All power is given unto me. And we're going to end this conversation in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. And Jesus is going to say, you shall receive power. (laughs) Amen. Amen. How about this? In Acts chapter, in Matthew chapter 28, he told a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors with nobody very smart in that crowd except for Matthew. That's arrogant from the accountant. (laughs) Keeper of customs. Amen. With nobody smart in that crowd, a bunch of fishermen. Amen. A bunch of fishermen. And Jesus said, just go teach all nations. One of them looked at the other and said, I didn't even know there was another nation. What are you talking about? Scratching his head. Amen. How are we going to get to all nations? How are we going to reach all nations? Well, since you're here in Acts 1, and I'll finish that in just a minute, look across the page in Acts chapter number 2. Verse number 5. This is when the Holy Ghost comes down and stays. Remember, we're operating on, we got orders from the Savior when he, when he left us. Go to all nations, and we can't figure that out. How in the world are we going to go to all nations? Verse number 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of, what's your Bible say? Every nation under heaven. I didn't write the book, but I do believe it. And this crowd stretching their head over here 10 days ago wondering how in the world are we going to reach all nations? And Jesus is saying, have you thought about looking around? They're here. <laughs> and you're going to win them. They're not going to stay, but they're going back home and you're going to go help them. That's the Macedonian call in Acts chapter 16. You're going to go help them and we're going to turn the world upside down for Jesus. So we're going to educate, we're going to evangelize, we're going to expand, but we're going to only be able to do it when we're empowered. That's Acts 1 verse 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both simultaneously at the same time, in Jerusalem, and in in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Because every creature still needs a preacher. And we get in on God's plan to send a missionary to do what he laid out in the scriptures. Let's stand. Celebrate the Lord's working. Confer what part can we have. Commit what does God want out of us.
Come on, Brother David, let's have a verse or two of invitation. I know it's a different message tonight, Brother Jamie. I knew it would be. It's a bit mechanical, but we need to know what God's sending those men to do that we're funding. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Now, there's components and pieces, and we understand that. And I'm not, I appreciate the work here with the boys. And that's part of the ministry of reaching the unsaved for Christ's sake. But when it comes to the establishment of New Testament churches, that's what it takes. That's what your missionaries are going to do. You said, preacher, I can pray for them better now. I can communicate better. I can follow their progress a little better. I hope so. But what I want you to consider tonight is what role does God want you to play? What amount does he want you to give? We need to be honest about that. Okay? What amount does he want you to give? What's your family going to do? How are you going to get involved? Where are you going to commit? How many more of your missionaries are you going to routinely reach out to and communicate with and be a blessing to? Those are subjects to take up in an altar. And I invite you while Brother David sings to do just that, Brother David.